And as we prepare for our message today, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear it with joy, what you say to us today. Amen. And as I have the last few times that I preached, I want to bring your attention to the the sermons coming up, and we're quickly getting to the end of the summer, and I'm starting to see the pews fill up as well, which is great. Uh, Today we'll be uh, going through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, and in a couple weeks we'll be focusing on James chapter 2. So I'd invite you to go ahead and start reading James as we prepare for that message. I'll be doing that as well, obviously, as I prepare our message for that day. But I want to review a little bit from our last message because it ties into our message today. And the key verse that I shared that that week was, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And uh, within this message, we understand that we are all called. We all have callings. We have a boss here on earth, maybe for work or for school or maybe even in the home, maybe your spouse. But we also have a boss in heaven our Lord Jesus Christ, who guides all our steps. And our Lord in heaven is that person. We have a Christian vocation in addition to the occupation or the schooling or the the work we do at home or whatever occupies our time throughout the week. And this encompasses all the spheres of our life, every hour of every week, every hour of every day. And we must then live a life worthy of this calling, a life worthy of the call that God has given us, and certainly as well, a life worthy of the one who has called us. So last time as well, I talked about some of the formal roles in the church, and these include apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. But these people are not set up to do all the work of the church. We are all called to the work of the church. And that's done for a particular purpose. These these individuals who have official or formal roles within the church are to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We are all equipped through this process, and certainly that includes me as well. I'm continuing to be equipped and to be developed by the people who are listed here. but as well, there, there are one set of results. Actually, there are multiple sets of results, but, but one set of results of being equipped is that we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. When we are young Christians, we can be tossed back and forth. We can be swayed by public opinion and by others we encounter. But through this equipping process, we become steadfast in the faith, and we're no longer blown back and forth. And the picture that I show here is taken when Jesus falls asleep on the boat and the disciples are there and they become fearful when the storms rise and the boat is being tossed around. And they awake Jesus, wondering why he could be sleeping in such a time. And Jesus calms the storm. And as we are equipped, we then come to be able to calm the storms with Jesus' support. So today's passage, as just read, helps us understand how we can confront these challenges, how we can calm those storms, and how we can make, maintain our steadfastness in the midst of those storms and navigate those storms. So moving to our passage for today, I start out with verse 10, and Paul writes here, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. We are called to find our strength in God and in the Lord and not in other places, not in the world, not in the people of this world, not in the authorities of this world, not in the institutions of this world, but also not within ourselves. Our strength comes from God and not internally. Hopefully, that's a relief to you. We don't have to build up all that strength on our own. It's given to us by God. So we don't rely on our own strength, on our own mind, and on our own accomplishments. But the armor of God described in this passage focuses our desire for strength on God. 
And it's God's armor that we put on. Paul continues, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So here Paul uses war imagery. This tells us that this is not a simple challenge. We're not against a small or minute or simple force. It's not a challenge that we can accomplish on our own. It is a battle. And for us as Christians in this battle, in many ways, it's a hidden battle. It's one we can't see with our eyes, and it's one that often, if we even try to contemplate it, it doesn't seem obvious as we think about it. But as we look at those who go into battle, we find that those individuals are focused on the task at hand. They don't go in thinking about other things. They have to be completely focused on the battle. They're equipped. They're given specific training. They're also unified with those with whom they fight. They follow the commands of one higher than themselves, as we do as Christians. They're provided with protection by those who surround them and by others, and they're provided with weapons. They're provided with equipment to help them fight this battle. But they also have something worthy of protection. In this world, it may be their nation or their culture or their way of life. But for us as Christians, it's our stand with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul continues to describe the source of our struggle. He writes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. As we encounter challenges in people in this world, we need to remember that usually that challenge is beyond the person and the struggle that is directly in front of us. In some ways, it may come from the individual's life experience, their culture that molded them. It may come from the tragedy that they've experienced, but it might also come from another force, a power that is earthly or outside this earth that is motivating them to struggle with us. So our fight is not against them in particular, it's what's behind them and what's motivating them and forcing them into this situation. But in this as well, we need to remember that if we win the battle against a specific individual, as we're able to reconcile with them, we need to remember that the battle is likely not over. The battle continues with whatever sat behind them, the forces of this earth or the forces of another world. So we need to remember that our battle remains. Paul continues, for our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is against more powerful and sometimes hidden forces. This is what's behind the individual behind us, or in front of us, I should say, behind them, or it may be the struggle that we have internally. Some examples of these might include rulers have, who have self-interests here on earth, or authorities trying to please other rulers or other authorities and their master for their own benefit. Powers may be focused on how many people they can control or how much geographical space they can have authority over. It could also include, as we look at individuals or corporations or other powers in this world, how much in profits they can attain or how much attention they can gain. And I'll focus on this a little bit in a few moments. But we also need to understand that there are truly spiritual forces of evil. Our battle is not only physical, it's spiritual as well. So Peter writes in relation to this in his letter, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And this is very true. The devil can come as a roaring lion and, and try to capture us and devour us. But I think often the way the devil works is such that it's more hidden and more subtle. The devil can be very crafty. And we see this in one of the first stories in the Bible coming from Genesis 
as the serpent says to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? He tries to twist the words of God and tries to capture the first people on earth. And we see this in our lives as well. So I want to focus a little bit on the subtle challenges of our day, but as we go into battle, we need to first understand the commands that have been given to us. So I go here, actually, your, your notes uh, pull from a passage from Matthew that's almost exactly the same from what I'm going to read. I've gone back and forth between these two passages, and after we printed the bulletin, I actually settled on Mark. So this comes from Mark chap- chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Mark writes, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Notice that Jesus had given them, a, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commands, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So I focus here on the first of those commandments, and we read here that our whole being, everything that is us, should love the Lord our God. And to do that, it should be completely focused on our Lord and our Lord's desires for our lives. And this includes our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And these are each areas that powers in this world and outside of this world will try to capture us. They'll try to pull away our mind or our heart or our soul or our strength. So there are forces of evil and other things that will try to beckon or call us. So I'd like to take a few moments to talk about what shows up in three different books that try to address some of the challenges of our world. And these are not, certainly, the limit of these various different forces. There are many other forces. These may be a challenge to you, but there may be others in your lives, and I would actually recommend or invite you to consider that there would be. And the first one that I want to address is a book called Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. This is a book by Michael Moss uh, from a few years ago. And, And Moss writes about the development of the food industry in the last several decades. And he writes about how the development of processed food has been, in some ways, a good thing for society. It has given us ready-made foods to eat very quickly. But as companies started to develop these meals, they found some interesting opportunities that they used to try to capture us. So the, the food companies have had to work very hard on extending the shelf life of foods. And often this involves salt, the first of the items that I'll, be, that I'll talk about. And this has been one of the challenge. We've wanted them cooked in microwaves. That's offered them a challenge. And as well, this has offered them an opportunity to increase demand and increase profits and revenues. And they've done this. So first, looking at salt. Salt was often used for many years to preserve food. It keeps food fresh and keeps bacteria and other agents from, uh, from growing within it, which would be a challenge to us. But for a long time, people thought that all people would crave salt because sodium in salt is something that all of us need. But scientists have actually, including food scientists working for the the food giants, have actually found that at birth and shortly thereafter, there's actually little interest in salt. Infants generally don't like salt. But as we have more salt, the preference level for salt increases. So as children start to have salt, they start to desire more and more, and we do as well. So we're attracted by more salt, but this craving is a learned behavior. So food companies have found that if they increase the salt in food to a point that matches the desires of of whoever they're targeting, they can increase the interests of all of us in that food. So they manipulate the amount of salt in food to try to get us to buy more of the food that they're producing. 
Food scientists of the, these companies have also looked intently at sugar. And they found that with sugar, there's a bliss point. And this is the term that they use. It's a bliss point. And they found that as they increase the amount of sugar in food to a point, we desire it more and more. So they increase the salt and we desire it more and we buy it more and more until it reaches a point and then that desire falls off. We start to taste too much sugar and we lose that desire. So they've found that they can target this bliss point and they can increase the sales of their food. They found as well, they've done analysis of different ages and they found that younger individuals, children, desire more sugar. Their bliss point is further to the right on the graph. And older individuals tend to desire less sugar in their food. So they target children intentionally with this. For children's cereals, for example, they increase the amount of sugar because they know the children will demand that food and they'll demand that from their parents and they'll sell more food. Um, and for older individuals, they'll set a, a lower bliss point. They'll do this with sugary drinks. Coca-Cola and Pepsi have done much of this as well. They've also done research and found that the interest in sugar follows similar neural pathways as addiction. And Moss writes here that American scientists who had made an intriguing discovery about sugary chocolate chip cookies, and Oreos have done this, Oreo cookies have done this to a large extent, but they found that the compulsion to overindulge these sugar and other sweets could be suppressed by the same drug that doctors use to block and counter the effects of heroin. They can actually suppress the desire in us for sugar by using the same drug that they use to suppress the addiction to heroin. So they manipulate sugar to get us to buy more. And finally, fat. Um, for fat, we don't actually tend to notice fat in food very much unless it's obvious to our sight or it's oily to the touch. So they can hide sugar, in, or I'm sorry, they can hide fat in the food without us noticing. So if it's not oily or fatty by sight, we tend to underestimate how much fat is in it. So meat, we often see the fat. But they use fat to change the texture of food. So it feels good to the hands before we put them in. This happens to crackers and to chips or, um, or fries, as some call them. Um, fat, as you may know, is the densest um, in calories of the various different basic uh, nutrients. And it, they've also found that the presence of fat tends to mask the amount of salt and sugar, which means as they increase the fat content, they also have to increase the fat, in, or I'm sorry, increase the salt and sugar to get the same impact for us. So this addiction of more sugar, or this addition of more sugar, has us believe that the fat has been reduced. It also masks the fat. Um, so as a result, we're being manipulated by these food companies in ways that don't seem obvious to us. The food companies have been calculating the optimum salt, sugar, and fat content to get us to buy more of the food. This makes sense. They want to increase their profits, and I can't necessarily fault them for that. Um, but they even do MRI studies. They'll put a person into an MRI and they'll feed them different foods and they'll look at what parts of the brain are lighting up and how substantially. And they do this to try to understand what foods we crave most. So they're looking at how our mind is operating for various different foods. Um, so they're optimizing food, in some cases, to maximize the release of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter in our body. It's responsible for pleasure sensations, but it's also involved in addiction. And this may be why the drug used to suppress heroin is successful also for sugar. And this is being done by all the large food companies, at least in the United States and Europe. But there are substantial health effects to what's happening here. We're seeing throughout the world now, those who adopt a more Western diet are experiencing obesity and high blood pressure, diabetes, arteriosclerosis or arterial clogging and heart attacks related to that. We're experiencing early, early death. But scripture tells us that our bodies should be a temple to the Holy Spirit. Taking care of our physical bodies 
is important as well. And as we experience this early death, we have less time to fulfill our calling as given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to move on to another book, and I'll move more quickly through this one. This book is called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Minds, and it's written by Nicholas Carr. Um, he, he's a journalist who has gone out and researched neuroscience and other things, and, and he's found that at one time, we believe that sometime in childhood or adolescence, the brain quit making physical changes. Neurons no longer rewired, and there were, was no, long, no longer any growth of neurons, and this has actually been proven false in recent years. The adult mind is continuing to change physically. These changes tend to accommodate what we do most frequently. The mind tries to make us more efficient. So what we do most often, it tries to create neural pathways to make happen more efficiently and more accurately. It also tends to happen for things that bring us pleasure. And he's taken some time to focus in particular on how we read. There's been a lot of, of science that has been done on this. And, and first, now that we're starting to read substantially on the internet and on computers, they found that we tend to read much smaller bits. If you read news on the internet, for example, you may be finding that articles seem to be getting shorter and shorter. And that's because that's been our desire. That's what we pay for and what we're willing to read. Um, so these articles are begin becoming shorter and our attention span as well is becoming shorter. And this is now carrying back into print publications. Newspapers and magazines are starting to have shorter and shorter articles. They're starting to include more photographs and charts and things like that to occupy the space. But they've also used eye tracking systems to watch people as they read. These eye tracking systems will actually be able to detect where the eyes are placed as we're reading through something, where they're placed on the page, whether it's on a computer screen or in a book. And they found that as they look at a computer screen, an F pattern tends to show up. And you can see that F pattern here on the right. Those areas that are in red are areas that over multiple individuals were read more frequently, yellow less frequently, and blue not very frequently at all. And this is one particular page, but it shows up on many different pages of various different types. And so people will read across the first line typically, they'll drop down, they'll read a little bit more, not quite as far over, they'll drop down a little bit more, and they read across less and less. And eventually, as they move down the page, they're reading hardly anything at all. So as a result of this, um, they've actually found that children are doing this with books as well, and adults are to a lesser extent. But we found that comprehension has declined. We're not reading the whole content of what's before us. We're reading less deeply, and we're thinking less deeply. And this is a concern to us as Christians because we are a people of the book. And we're to have Scripture mold us and change us. It's a, a challenge for our society as well in many different ways. But for us as Christians, it's a particular challenge. Um, They've also looked at, at the effect of computers and how we're relying on computers, our phones and our tablets and other devices to be our memory. We're keeping less in our minds and more in other places because we're overwhelmed with, with information today. And they found um, that as we rely less on our memory and more on external resources, we don't have all that internally, obviously, and we think more shallowly. We don't think as deeply. We can't assemble all, the, all of the information because we don't have it all together at one time. Our mind can't be focused on every file that we have on our computer and every email that we have in our phones or wherever else we're storing our information. So we can't assemble the information in our minds as we once did. We can't put all of this together. We've heard as well in the last couple sermons some of the challenges as well that come from the use of Facebook. We read very short snippets and, and we're used to getting instant gratification in having ourselves be flooded with serotonin. They found this as well, flooded with serotonin and, and this pleasure sensation from reading through and feeling like we're closely connected with a whole bunch of people who may live thousands of miles away from us. We may see once a year or once every 10 years but really don't have a personal relationship with. 
we also see there that people are posting only the good things in our lives. And this leads other individuals to experience a depression because we start to believe that our life doesn't match up to, up to those other individuals who we read all these perfect things, post after post. But we do the same. Few of us, I suspect, as we go out and post, are posting the challenges of life. And therefore, we promote this and we develop this depression. And the final uh, one that I want to look at is the capturing of our souls. And this is actually an older book of which... Uh, many of you may be familiar, and this comes from the Screwtape Letters, which was written by C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, in the preface of this book, writes, There are two equal and opposite heirs into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and un unhealthy interest in them. And I would say in the West... The largest challenge is that we deny that any forces of evil truly exist in any embodied form, that we deny that the devil and that demons exist, but they really do. And we forget this and we allow them to invade our lives in various different ways. But as C.S. Lewis writes here as well, it's an equal and concerning risk if we get overwhelmed on this, about this, if we focus on that and let our minds be captured by that. The, the book Screwtape Letters, I would invite you to read. It takes a little while to get your mind wrapped around it because it's a set of letters that are written essentially from an elder demon to a young demon who's learning the trade. And the trade here is trying to capture the minds of humans and trying to capture the souls of humans for the evil one. And I've included here uh, one short snippet from the book. Uh, that shows some of the work that happens. And, and as the elder demon is trying to mentor the younger one, he's trying to describe their methods and how he can go about capturing this, this specific human uh, who has recently accepted Christ and accepted the faith. And he writes to the younger demon, the first thing is to delay as long as possible the moment at which he realizes this new pleasure as a temptation. He's, he's had a new pleasure that's sinful. Since God's servants have been preaching about the world as one of the great standard temptations for 2,000 years, this might seem difficult to do. But fortunately, they have said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see much, indeed more than I'd like, about greed, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that, your patient, the individual he's trying to win, would probably classify as Puritanism. And may I remark in passing that the value we have given to, the, to that world is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years? By it, we rescue annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety of life. Obviously, C.S. Lewis isn't uh, a witness to the conversations that are happening. This is a fictional story, but it helps us imagine how these forces are trying to co-opt us and trying to pull us away from God. And this is just one example of, of C.S. Lewis's imagination of how this is happening. So I'd invite you to, to read this book. It's available both in physical and and ebook form. But moving back to our passage today and, and related passages, Paul writes in Romans, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So here we see that we should not be forced into the image that the world is trying to force us into. We should not be forced into its, into its systems or into its molds or into its practices. We need to remember that we have to resist those. So moving into the armor of God, Paul writes, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. 
So it's buckled around our waist. This belt of truth is fastened to us. It's secured to us. And this belt of truth then is primarily that we're a truth-telling people as Christians. Those of us who have watched others lie or reflected on lies in our own lives know that often one lie leads to another, which leads to yet another, and eventually we have a flood of lies that now we have to somehow address. It destroys the unity. It prevents others from seeing the truth of God through us. And we're called then to act out this truth in all spheres of our life, And at the same time, knowing that that places us at risk, it gives us challenge. But we know that we serve a greater Lord and enjoy also his benefits. So there's a promise given to us if we hold true to what is true. But it also refers to the need for us to seek truthful doctrine. We need to understand God in truthful ways. And later, Paul writes about how we can go about that. And next, Paul writes about the breastplate of righteousness. And he writes, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place. So Paul is referring here that we are a people of righteousness and justice in every place and in relation to every person. We need to remember that God left the Israelites when they failed to exhibit this righteousness and justice. And we could be left in the battle without God as well if we fail to enact this. In the book of Amos, the prophet writes to the Israelites, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. And continuing a bit later, he writes, But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, or a never-failing stream. God is commanding them to let justice and righteousness pervade everywhere. And without that, he finds their worship and their festivals and their sacrifices to be a stench, to be um, distressing to him, and to be... Um, despised by him. And that may be true of us as well if we don't exhibit his righteousness and justice. Paul then writes of the gospel of peace or the good news of peace. And he writes, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So first, this is peace with God. We need to have peace with God. And this comes in part through confession. We need to confess the sins of our past life and of our current life so that we can be at peace with God. But it also comes with peace with one another. We need to be at peace with one another, particularly with other Christians. And this is central to this letter, as Paul writes through this letter, about the unity he's trying to create within the Ephesians. Next, Paul writes of the shield of faith. And he writes, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We need to hold to the assurance that we are justified or saved through grace by faith. And this is the shield of faith. If we hold on to this faith, the arrows that the evil one throws at us, the insults, the questions, and the accusations will have no effect. That faith will hold strong, and those arrows may hit the shield and and actually poke into the shield, but they won't reach us. They may even bounce off that shield. So next, Paul writes of the helmet of salvation. He tells us to take the helmet of salvation. And this is our assurance that we are already in God's grace. We are already saved, and God protects us and reassures us through this knowledge. Next, Paul writes of the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. And he writes, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is actually the only offensive weapon in the whole armor of God that's covered here. But it's only a useful weapon if we use it. 
If our, if our Bibles sit on our shelves and gather dust, or we simply carry them around and we don't actually open them, if we don't actually try to engage the entirety of Scripture, they're of little use to us. They may be a good paperweight, they may take up some shelf space, but they don't actually change us. We need to be in the Scriptures regularly. The author of the letter of Hebrews writes elsewhere, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And we need to allow scripture to do this within us. As we read scripture, we need to allow it to judge our thoughts and attitudes, and to judge our heart so that it can mold us. And through that, it will become a weapon for us. And lastly, Paul writes a prayer, and he writes, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So Paul writes of praying in the Spirit. Some traditions target this in a particular way, and I want to address that briefly. It's not necessarily in tongues, though it can be. We could pray in tongues, and that's praying in the Spirit, but this also means that we pray with the Spirit's influence, even if we speak in our native language or in another language that we understand. But the Spirit guides our prayers in whatever language we use, and we rely on the Spirit to intercede for us, and to provide assistance in our prayers. And Paul writes in the book of Romans again, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So be assured That as we pray, even if we don't know what we need to pray for or the words that we should use, the Spirit is praying on our behalf. The Spirit intercedes for us, and it does that in accordance with the will of God. We also need to lift up to God all kinds of prayers and requests. And this includes praise and adoration. We do this because God deserves our praise but it also has us to acknowledge our rightful place in relation to God. We praise God, and in praising God, we accept that we're subordinate. Next, we need to offer up our confession, because we need forgiveness, and we need to confess our sins. But we also need to initiate the process of repentance within ourselves. We need to give thanksgiving because God, again, deserves our thanksgiving because everything that we have comes from God. We need to acknowledge from where our blessings come. And finally, we need to be including supplications and requests. We need to understand that we can't accomplish this work alone. We need God's help to make our way through this life and to accomplish what he has called us to do. So with all of this, and the scare that maybe this armor of God and these powers and principalities of the earth may cause us, I want to leave you with a promise. So I take this again from Romans, uh, from the Apostle Paul, and, and Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I invite you to go forward this day with this promise, but to put on the full armor of God and to do that through your work in the days ahead. And I offer this to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I would like to invite forward Sister Didi.
to include our congregational prayer.